All right. Well, I would like to thank uh, again the organizers of this uh, beautiful workshop. Actually, been learning a lot. And I wanted to talk about something which is of relevance to the group, namely more about turbulence. But I would like also to say something about the rigorous side as much as possible. And I'm going to talk about statistical properties of the Navier-Stokes Voigt model. And uh, I will uh, start, this is joint work. With, it's an old work with the, uh, my former PhD students, Boris Devant and the former postdoc, uh, Fabio Ramos. So uh, we know that in turbulence, we have all kinds of like uh, scales and the idea is to capture some of those scales and what's going on there and really preach into the choir in that sense. Let's start from the Navier-Stokes equation and uh, of uh, incompressible fluid and uh, with the kinematic viscosity positive and either boundary condition zero and Dirichlet or periodic. And one can consider flows in R2 or in R3. Okay, so this is the equation at, at hand. I'm going to develop some of the uh, issues that the experts in this audience can even teach me about, but I would like to give it uh, some kind of like uh, 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 a framework which is will be useful for what I'm going to talk about later and I'm following to large extent the approach of Foyage in this uh, direction. So uh, often in physicists when they talk about average they put some kind of like bracket and it's never clear to us what exactly meant and even engineers in that sense work. So mathematically it means the expectation phi with respect to some measure in some function space u of some nice function phi. And uh, for, uh, for solutions of the navier stock. So one can consider invariant measures, for example, which are in some sense supported on the global attractor of the navier stokes equation. One can also look at measures supported navier stokes equation on path solutions, which should be stable with respect to some small random perturbation. Or what can also talk about Stationary statistical solution measures, and this is as defined in Foyash, and I will approach, use this approach and I'll define them uh, more precisely later. These are measures which satisfy the Liouville type equation and then talk statistically stationary. And I'm talking about the deterministic equation, namely that we need to have an invariant measure on the space, on the phase space of solutions. So let me just set some notation. So I will call V, which is the space of test functions. So in case of Dirichlet boundary condition, they are compactly supported C infinity functions, which are incompressible. In the periodic boundary conditions, one can think about phi being trigonometric polynomials, which are divergence free. If I take this space and look to its closure in the L2 norm, I call this the space H. And the closure in the Sobolev norms H1, namely that the closure in the, the norm is L2 and the L2 of the gradient, I will call this the space V. I will try it as much as possible to avoid this notation H and V, but in case sometimes they come, I wanted to tell you that these are the phase spaces that I'm interested. The space V is where the dissipation of energy, it's important to make sense of dissipation of energy, and the space H in order to make sense of energy to begin with. Now, because the space H is, in some sense, L2 functions, which are incompressible divergence free. So if I take any uh, function, which is in L2, I can do the Helmholtz decomposition. And then when you do the Helmholtz decomposition, we can project this function from L2 onto the space H divergence free. And this projection is called the Leray Hoff uh, projection, which is uh, uh, cancels or kills the gradient of the pressure when we apply it to an equation because Helmholtz decomposition says the function is either divergence free plus a gradient of somebody. Now, if I apply the Helmholtz projection, then the Navier Stokes equation, let me define the operator A, which we call the Stokes operator, which is the composition of negative Laplacian with the Leray Helmholtz projection. And the nonlinearity BUV, which is the transport equation, the Leray Hopf sorry, the Leray Helmholtz projection, PL. Now you ask, what about the pressure? The PL of H kills the pressure, so therefore we don't have pressure. As a result, the Navier-Stokes for us looks as 
a functional equation, the UDT in the space of functions, which is H or V, depending on what I'm going to talk about. So this is the time derivative. This is the given forces. This is the viscosity or the viscous term. And this is the nonlinearity, and the pressure disappeared. And this is the definition of the nonlinearity. So therefore, I can think about it as an evolution equation in the Hilbert space. So if we're assuming a statistical equilibrium, namely that there is some kind of like average, which is uh, the time average is, uh, is, is, is converging. So uh, Reynolds considered this equation, if you look to this, and if you look to the time average, infinite time average, then you kill the time derivative because the, if you look, assume a solution is bounded. So the integral of the time average of the derivative gives you zero, infinite time average. Therefore, formally you get the average of this equation, which is, I'm going to denote it by bracket. As I told you, bracket could mean anything, and I'll try to be specific as much as possible what is meant here. Eventually, I will mean average with respect to some invariant measure. So this is the average of the viscous term. This is the average of the nonlinear term. Now, what happens here is that the average of product is not product of the averages. And therefore, I would like to look at it as the product of the averages. There is a leftover. And this leftover is given by the interaction of the fluctuation with itself, divergence form, average. And this is what people call usually the Reynolds stresses. So if this term is not here, life would be easy. And the average Reynolds equation is nothing but a steady state Navier-Stokes equation because the bracket here is a function and the unknown will be to solve here. And we know that this equation has solution for sure, at least one, but it could be infinitely many. However, this equation is not closed because I need, if you take the quantity U minus average with respect to this bracket, this is the fluctuation. I look to this term. In order to find a closed equation, I need to find equation that governs the motion of U double prime. And all we know, if I would like to find an equation governing the double U prime, I will go for next moments and next moments, and I never close. And this is what's so-called usually the closure problem. So this is the Reynolds equation that we have that I would like to talk about it uh, uh, sometime later. So as I said, the second order moments of fluctuations, the Reynolds equation stress is not really closed, and this is the equation that we are interested in, in some sense, in trying to solve or make sense of its solution. Now, let me uh, talk here about some notation. Suppose I have wave numbers, k prime and k double prime, and I look for uk, the velocity field projected between the wave number k prime and k double prime, and I look at the energy in this shell between k double prime K prime and K double prime. This is the energy evolution in that shell. This is the dissipation in that shell. And now I will have a flux of energy from the inner shell and the outer shell. And this is the contribution or projection of uh, coming from the force. Now I need to define what's EK in general. EK is the entering, uh, uh, entering from the uh, from the left uh, flux and going out from the out, uh, entering from the right flux. So the EK up is the contribution of low modes, low modes interaction with the high modes. And this one is the high modes, high modes interaction with the low modes. And this is an identity, okay? So this is the flux of energy at the shell between K prime and K double prime. There is nothing really uh, 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 new for you here. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, all known, but I'm setting the Framework for I want to talk about the Voigt model later. So now we consider the 3D Navier Stokes equation in some domain. Let's say periodic boundary condition with length scale large characteristic large scale is 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 L. Now we will have uh, two small scales: the Kolmogorov scale and the viscous uh, a, a scale, uh, such that the statistical equilibrium of the dynamics UK exhibits some three different regimes. The First regime up to the Kolmogorov, we have what we call the inertial rain dynamics is governed by mainly the viscous, uh, the inviscid case like Euler equation. We don't see much of the effect of the viscosity. The dissipation range, the energy is in some sense transformed from the inertial range into 
to be absorbed in the dissipation range, and then the dissipation range K prime, where basically dynamics is effectively governed by the Stokes equation and the, 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 the nonlinear term becoming very small because the energy in the nonlinearity, because it's quadratic, is small and is governed by here. And I would like, in some sense, to follow an approach uh, in order to say something about these particular uh, wave numbers, critical wave numbers, the Kolmogorov, etc. And I would like to do the analog in case of the Voigt model, because that's what the purpose of this lecture today. So uh, there is uh, some hypothesis, the central hypothesis also in Kolmogorov's theory is homogeneous turbulence states that in the inertial range, there's no interaction between shells K prime, K W prime, and shell K1 and K2 when there is a separation between the shells. Namely, if you took the shell K prime, K W prime, and one K1 and K2, then if uh, twice K W prime smaller than K1, there is some some separation, then they don't see the energy, the, the energy interaction does not see, there is some kind of like, they don't talk to each other, so it is in some sense since cascaded from shell to shell. This is some kind of like underlined uh, hypothesis. So, assuming also the anomalous dissipation conjecture, which tells you that if you look for the rate of dissipation of energy in the average in time, as time goes to infinity, and then the limit as viscosity goes to zero, suppose this quantity exists and this epsilon remains positive, this is the anomalous dissipation, then there is universality hypothesis that in this limit of infinite Reynolds number, namely as viscosity go, goes to zero, the small scale statistics in some sense are uniquely and universally determined by the link scale, k minus one, where k is wave number, and by the mean rate of dissipation, epsilon. So when epsilon, when, when nu is very small, that's basically what is expected. So taking this into account, so if you look into the wave, sorry, if you, a typical velocity coming from the energy density at wave number k to the power one half, and if you think about tk to be characteristic velocity and time scale, this is the time scale at this wave number, respectively, by the universality hypothesis, the expression for the characteristic time scale are given t is like length over velocity, so it's one over k time. But at the same, at, at, but at the same time, we know that because of the viscosity, the expression, the time scale is given also by u k squared divided by epsilon. So equating these two expressions together, okay, equating these two expressions together allows me that to show that u k is like epsilon to the one third k to the minus one third, which is in some sense, therefore, if you look to the energy spectrum, let me u k squared, you get the k to the minus two third. And the relevant or the corresponding time scale of the wave number k or the length scale one over k is given by this quantity. So therefore, the Kolmogorov dissipation scale where now viscosity effect, so the time scales is a viscous, a purely viscous effect. So the rate of dissipation is one over nu k squared. This is the time. And therefore, if you equate this time with the time from the previous slide at the wave number of Kolmogorov, you discover that the critical number is like epsilon over nu to the one, to, to the power, to our three, to the power one four. And hence the Kolmogorov length scale, which is one over k, the one over k nu is a new cube over epsilon to the one quarter. And these quantities, everybody knows it's in classical textbooks and so on and so forth. But I went through this because I want to develop the analog, as I said, for the Voigt model. So basically these pictures, you know that there is energy spectrum and there is fluctuations, uh, which is the, the intermittency. And I will talk about some of that later. So now, because I'm gonna use some viscoelastic model, which is the voice model. So increasing the elasticity of polymers, the energy flux in the turbulent cascade is partially suppressed and transferred to elastic degree of freedom. This suppression remains partial 
even for large values of elasticity. The elastic dissipation removes only a finite fraction of the flux. Moreover, the effect of polymers on turbulence is local in scales, i.e. large enough scales are essentially not affected by the presence of polymers. Okay. Now, if I take the following model of viscoelasticity, which is called the Navier-Stoist-Voigt model, coming from the Kelvin Voigt model. If you look into it, there is a new term which is coming from the stress tensors with delay. And if you do the expansion and so on and so forth from this delay term, you discover that you have from the stresses the following additional term, the time derivative of a parameter alpha square Laplacian of u. So this alpha in parentheses up here, just to integrate that I'm talking about solution depending on the parameter alpha. So if alpha equals to zero, I get exactly the Navier-Stokes. However, there is this extra term, which is the time derivative of the Laplacian coming into the equation. And this is a, a, a model which is called the, 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 the Navier-Stokes Voigt uh, model. And it is considered in domain. Now notice that usually when you give me equation, I need to give boundary condition. Because the Navier-Stokes has Laplacian, usually if I give you Dirichlet boundary condition, U at the boundary is given to zero. However, now I have also Laplacian of the time derivative. Therefore, this equation requires a boundary condition for the time derivative. But I don't need to worry about that because if U is given to me at the boundary to be zero, the time derivative at the boundary equals also to zero. And hence this model Automatically, one boundary condition, the Dirichlet is gives you the relevant boundary condition also for the time derivative. Now, why I'm mentioning this? Because I will show you in a minute that this model has, or I'm not sure, not, I'm not going to prove it, but I'm going to state it, has global existence in 2D as well as in 3D when alpha is different than zero. Therefore, I would like to think about this as a regularizing model of the Navier-Stokes equation, alternative to hyperviscous, for example, regularization of Navier-Stokes. And know that if you put hyperviscosity to regularize the equation numerically or otherwise, then I require for higher order Laplacian ad hoc boundary condition if I am going to solve equations or Navier-Stokes in bounded domain or in domains with physical boundaries. Therefore, the issue of boundary condition when you put artificial hyperviscosity or regularization is an important issue because one might introduce some boundary layer effects and so on and so forth. At least in this regularization, we don't need to introduce ad hoc boundary condition. It is coming naturally in this uh, particular equation. So this is the equation uh, uh, that I would like to consider. And this is uh, the equation of, of motion. Uh, I'm not going to tell you much about the history. We discovered this equation by manipulating the alpha turbulence model and doing all kinds of properties until we reached to it. And we just thought that we discovered this equation by, uh, by our, ourselves. But it turns out that it has been known long before us in the viscoelastic community. And in fact, the first rigorous mathematical paper about showing global existence for this model was in the thesis of Skolkov who was a student of Ladezhanskaya already in 1973. Now, when, when we studied this equation together with Kalantarov in 2009, we proved that it has a global finite dimensional attractor. Now, let me mention here uh, something about this equation to go back. If you look at this equation and forget about the nonlinearity, forget about the nonlinearity. If you look at the time derivative of the Laplacian and you have Laplacian, Laplacian and Laplacian cancels, and this equation is like du dt like u. This is an ODE. So in that sense, because I have the time derivative in the Laplacian and I have viscosity, effectively this equation is not a partial differential equations where the right-hand side of the evolution is unbounded operator or involving unbounded operator. It is 
an equation with nonlinearity, which is one can show in the right spaces to be Lipschitz, and therefore one can use the Picard iterative methods to show existence and uniqueness. In particular, this equation is no longer parabolic in nature. I don't see immediately the smoothing effect like the heat equation and so on and so forth, because as I said, I have time derivative of the Laplacian and the Laplacian, they cancel, I wouldn't see the uh, regular, regularizing effect. Now, this equation also without viscosity has a global existence for the reason I just mentioned to you because an ODE. And hence, one can think about this equation as a regularization of Euler equation when the viscosity equal to zero. And not only of the Navier-Stokes equation, at least in particular in the periodic boundary condition. Moreover, one can show that the solution or the global attractor belongs to Gevray clause. In, in other words, it is analytic functions. And hence, the elements on the global attractor, after certain length scale, the energy dissipating or decaying exponentially fat. And this is consistent with the dissipation length scale we want to see in the interpolant flows. And as I said, because I don't have the regularizing mechanism, so if you give me solution in the space H1 Sobolev space, I don't expect the solution to be nicer. However, because this term becoming like damping, one can decompose the initial data or the solution into initial data, which is very smooth, like analytic, plus initial data, which is rough or the rough part. Eventually, as time goes to infinity, one can show that the rough part decays to zero and only the analytic part remains, and hence the attractor consisting of analytic functions, which are consistent with what I would like to see, that I have a dissipation range where the energy is exponentially small. And this is all at the level of three-dimensional uh, Navier-Stokes Voigt model. Now, why all this is important? Because, again, if I look at this equation and formally type the time average, infinite time average, the time derivative disappear, and voila, I see no difference anymore between this equation and the Navier-Stokes, because the difference between this equation and Navier-Stokes is this term which is involving the time derivative. Hence, the Reynolds equation associated with Navier-Stokes and with the Voigt model are the same. So the dynamics of the two models is different, but the average or the average quantity satisfy the same equation. Of course, we know that this equation might have many solutions. Some could be related or not related, but this was a very strong indication to us that if we would like to talk about turbulence, which is a statistical theory or long time average quantity, hence there is a chance that even though the dynamics of this equation is different, it might capture, at least for alpha small, some of the statistics of the Navier-Stokes, especially that formally, when alpha equals to zero, it is the Navier-Stokes equation. So this raises the question, as I said, of possibility of a, a, an effective smooth approximation of Navier-Stokes equations, statistics via the statistics of the Navier-Stokes Voigt equation. So notice the following, that this model, which is the Navier-Stokes Voigt, if I take viscosity equals to zero, I can show that this quantity is conserved. Notice alpha equal to zero, it's exactly the L2 norm, like an Euler equation. So this is a, like a regularization for Euler equation. So it has a new conserved quantity. So this quantity is constant. And this equation has a global existence and uniqueness in this space H1. So therefore this term, because it is constant, it shows you that the gradient cannot be too large because it is penalized by the factor alpha and hence the wave number one over alpha seemingly playing an important role. So in some sense, what this says that the regularizing mechanism here is different than the hyperviscous regularizing mechanism because in the hyperviscosity, 
I don't touch the initial, the inertial range, or the, I don't touch the nonlinearity. So energy is cascaded, and then it, when it accumulates at the large wave numbers, hyperviscosity is a higher rate of consuming of energy, and hence it regularizes. However, because I have a new energy, this term alpha, this regularizing, is not really dissipating things fast, but it seems that it does something at the energy cascade that inhibits or controls the rate of cascading energy around the wave number one over alpha. And this is what I will talk about in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. This is, again, I call epsilon alpha the mean rate of dissipation of energy with respect to some average. And I said, eventually, this average will be the uh, statistically stationary uh, solution, namely an invariant measure uh, corresponding to this uh, equation. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, if I look at the wave numbers of interest uh, that, I, that, I, that I have uh, in mind, as I mentioned uh, earlier, so for, the, for, the, for any invariant measures of the Navier-Stokes Voigt model, which we call it mu alpha, so if you have two wave numbers, k prime and k double prime, in which the forcing is not active, so the force is active on the low wave numbers, so the mean rate of dissipation of energy is equal to, at, at this shell between k prime and k double prime, is equal to the fluxes. This is, a, can, one can show, there is equality, not a sort of like, it is a rigorous uh, result. And for, for, for wave numbers which are large enough, then the, the rate of energy the, uh, dissipation is equal to how much a flux of energy coming from the high modes. Now, let us really uh, pause for a second here. We have to define the following characteristic velocities at wave number k. One is coming from the energy spectrum of the velocity u. So it's u squared to the one half. Another option is I have this regularizing mechanism. This is coming from one minus alpha squared Laplacian. This has units of, I, of, of, this has no units. It's like a neutral. And therefore, one can define a typical characteristic velocity to be given by this quantity. Is it, so is it this one or this one that one needs to use in order to derive some kind of like inertial range or energy spectrum? So uh, we denote the characteristic uh, kinetic energy at, at, uh, at wave number k to be S2, which is U0, which is exactly given by this one. And S alpha is exactly coming from this quantity which is nothing but the product of these two quantities together. So if you multiply this by this, you get exactly square. So we have two different kind of like uh, 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 characteristic kinetic, uh, kinetic energy. Now we, we denote S2 is the total energy coming from the dissipation from this particular regularization, which is, uh, I would call it S2 alpha. So there is S2 zero which is exactly the total energy, and the S2 alpha is exactly this quantity. And notice when alpha equals to zero, this is exactly U0, U0, which is the usual energy. So I have two different velocities, characteristic velocities, and the question which one I should use in order to derive situation. So for wave number K or length scale one over K, a typical, Time scale could be S2 alpha k divided by epsilon alpha. And therefore, in that, that sense, the T k alpha, we have also one over k u k. So we have this quantity and this quantity, and we need to equate them. And I am puzzled which u k I should use. Should I use u k to be u k alpha, or should I choose u k zero, or should I take even an interpolation between them or combination between them, like, com like some kind of geometric combination or something like, like that. So when we did some simulation in order to recover some of the statistics of Navier-Stokes, and we are not really computational people, so we did it for the Sabra shell model, and I will show you some of this computation. We realized that in order to get consistency 
with, with the statistics that I want for the Navier Stokes when alpha is small, one has to take UK to be UK zero and not UK alpha. All right, so let's follow up with that. And if I follow up with that, this yields that the S2 alpha energy is satisfying this law. And hence the energy spectrum is given by this power law. Notice when alpha equals to zero, when alpha equals to zero, you get exactly k to the minus one third, and therefore u k zero square is k to the minus two third as we would have expected. But now there is a correction term here depending on alpha, and the time scales, corresponding time scales, which is like that, is given by this quantity. And now at the dissipation length or the small lengths, if I would like to look what happens at small lengths. So when the dissipation time scale is like one over new k square. So when I equate it with tau k alpha, I have the following observation. For alpha small, for alpha small, smaller than eta, which is the Kolmogorov length scale, then the small scale, the dissipation scale in this model is corresponding to Kolmogorov. Aha, which means if my regularizing parameter is smaller than Kolmogorov, then I basically see Navier stocks all the way up to the uh, Kolmogorov scale, and I don't see any problem. And therefore, this is consistent even with the mathematics, alpha being very, very small relative to what? Relative to Kolmogorov, statistics is really not affected. And I'm a good approximation for the Navier Stokes equation. Now, however, if alpha is larger, oh, sorry, if alpha is larger than the Kolmogorov, then we realize that the dissipative length scale is larger than the Kolmogorov, and the ratio between them is given by these quantities. These are all again plausible or heuristic arguments based on the, 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 the issues that I have just mentioned. Now, as we know, the Navier-Stokes in Fourier is given by convolution from the nonlinearity plus a pressure term and viscous term and forcing, and with the incompressibility. Now, inspired by this, notice that the nonlinear interaction, and here is the wave number, this is like the gradient, this L is the gradient, the derivative with the I. It is an infinite convolution now. Uh, the, the, there are many models which call the shell model inspired by this by keeping also this kind of like this hypothesis of locality of uh, of uh, uh, Kolmogorov that shells which are separated the energy cascade or the energy fluxes do not see each other they need to they start to see each other one next to the other like like a dominoes instead of like you don't jump from here into far away taking that into account. So the, what the Sabra models looked into localizing in Fourier space this interaction and not taking infinite convolution, but interacting nearby wave numbers. And the model that I will have or consider here is the Sabra shell model, uh, which was developed uh, by the group in Weizmann, Prokacia, Lvov, and co-workers, and then studied by many others. Uh, uh, and this is the model that we have in mind. U n are complex sequence, infinite complex sequence of complex numbers. And now i k n is like the wave number n. This is the nonlinear term, but you can see that nearby interactions. And there's another term nearby interaction with some parameter epsilon. Another nearby interaction term. So this is like the nonlinear term. This is the viscous term. And this is sort of like the forcing, if you want. Okay. This is a, the, 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 the model. Uh, usually, we take it with boundary condition. We initialize this process by u minus 1, u 0 to be 0. And then we look for what's happening to here. So kn is the wave numbers. Usually, people take, take kn to be k0, 2 to the power n. And this is the shell model, which is a simple model inspired by the Navier Stokes, by the Fourier expansion, and uh, has uh, been used to show that it possesses many of the nice statistics of the Navier Stokes equation. And I say there was a lot of work by people, especially the, the Weizmann group uh, led by Prokacia and Volv and company and, uh, and, and uh, 
So let me tell you something about this model. So we have here a parameter epsilon. So epsilon is between zero and one. So in the inviscid case, and I'm forced, this model has two quadratic invariant quantities, at least at the formal level. Okay, one is the energy, the L2 norm, and the other one is sine indefinite is one over epsilon minus one to the power n. So notice that when epsilon between zero and one, this is a number which is negative to the power n, so it's alternate, alternating. And this is mimics the role of the helicity. On the other hand, if epsilon bigger than one, by the way, this is a positive quantity, and this is somehow to the power n, so this is like a derivative. So in some sense, this is becoming like the entropy because it's positive definite. And hence, we can think about epsilon as a parameter that takes us from 2D to 3D and vice versa while you're crossing or bifurcating from epsilon less than one to epsilon bigger than one. So this is some of the computations of the shell model. And we can see some kind of like for viscosity new to the power 10 to the power minus nine, you can see almost like a K to the minus uh, uh, one third, K to the minus 0 0.36 uh, power spectrum. And then boom, you see the dissipation range for the shell model. And one can see intermittency, which is like the fluctuation in the mean rate of dissipation divided by the mean rate of dissipation. So you can see that once in a while you have a strong intermittency. Uh, in the, and this is the time, and this is the, the, the epsilon prime over epsilon, namely the fluctuation in epsilon divided by epsilon. Now, if you look at H to be the little L2, this is the phase space for the shell model. This is the inner product. So this is the space of uh, kinetic energy. And as I said, you look for the space of infinite sequences. And if you multiply by K n to the power 2D, I call this VD, this is the analog of Sobolev spaces. The results we have that for the viscous Sabra shell model, it has a unique weak and strong solution globally exists for all the parameter regime for the shell data in L2, as we expected even in 2D Navier Stokes equation. In fact, one can show even it has a global attractor and an inertial manifold, but that's a different means. Inertial manifold means that effectively the dynamics is, can be represented by an ODE. Okay. So moreover, uh, 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 for reinforcing, which is like say finitely many modes, so all the high frequencies are zero, then one can show that the energy decaying exponentially. And this is the analog of the Gevray class I mentioned earlier, namely it is indication of existence of dissipation, length scale and dissipation regime, which is exponentially, exponentially small, okay? So what happens if you have no viscosity? So the inviscid Sabra shell model has weak global solution with, the, with finite energy. And now we don't know if this solution is unique or not unique. It might not be unique. And one of our ideas was, and then we quit, I don't know why, we got busy with other stuff, is in some sense to try to show the zero law, the Kolmogorov zero law or the dissipation anomaly by maybe showing that there are solutions of the Sabra shell models that maybe blow up and hence to show when the viscosity go to zero that you can get dissipation anomaly, but that's a different uh, issue. So now I would like to introduce the analog of the Navier-Stokes Voigt Sabra shell model. All what I need to do is to regularize the model further by adding minus alpha Laplacian square of the time derivative. So it is, here is the Laplacian square symbol is Kn square with minus sign. And hence, all what I need to do is to look to this equation adding this term. So this is the Navier-Stokes Voigt Sabra shell model. And now I would like to study this model at least numerically and see the effect of the parameter alpha as I have mentioned. We have this energy, this is what I called S two alpha in the case because I have alpha and alpha equal to zero, I get the original model. So this is exactly, as I said, the S2 alpha, which is the original energy plus, uh, plus, uh, plus this uh, kind of, uh, but this is S2 Kn, namely at wave number Kn. This is the energy, the S alpha at energy at that. This is the structure function, if you want 
uh, at alpha. This is S2KN, namely when alpha equals to zero. Again, characteristic velocity, we will take it to be UK zero. And then the energy dissipation rate is given by this quantity, by the whatever dissipating the energy multiplied by the viscosity, but the viscosity has been taken to be one, so, but you have to have viscosity. And now here is some simulation with this model. So here, what happens is uh, uh, some simulation. I, for some reason, I, oops, let me, uh, let me go back. Okay. So here is, a, 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 I cannot, uh, for some reason, this is hidden for me. Aha, uh -huh. I can do that. So this is for viscosity. Uh, this is for viscosity uh, 10 to the minus 9 and alpha parameter 10 to the minus 6. You can see that the, uh, the plus sign is the S2 alpha and the circle sign S2, namely this is with the alpha weight without the alpha weight. And this is the straight line K to the minus 2 tail. So you can see that the inertial range is nice. But seemingly around the wave number one over alpha, something happened to the spectrum and it's becoming flat because alpha is not smaller than the Kolmogorov ring scale. So this is inhibits somehow the, it is slows the cascade of energy, which is allows even for, this what allows for the regularization mechanism. Now, if you take, uh, So now, if I take alpha to be between minus 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 8, so different, I take a, 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 a variation. So 10 to the minus 5 is this one. You can see how flat is the energy spectrum here becoming. And the smaller and smaller the alpha, you are converging until eventually you get to the usual inertial range when alpha is so small, smaller than the Kolmogorov length scale. So in some sense, this is regularizing the equation, but the statistics is 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 uh, is uh, is uh, uh, becoming uh, more and more correct when alpha is smaller, and this explains the regularization mechanism is not by dissipating the high wave numbers faster, but by inhibiting the cascade of energy. Now uh, toward the end, so in the previous figures we have seen that the larger values of alpha uh, that for the larger than the Kolmogorov uh, dissipation scale, the Navier-Stokes void slows the cascade of energy, as I mentioned. Now, as a consequence of the above uh, fact, we also show that the figure that the Navier-Stokes uh, void seemingly suppresses intermittency. And let me show you that in some computation. This is the situation when alpha equal to zero. This is the intermittency for the void model without, sorry, not the void model, for the uh, shell model without any effect of the alpha. So you can see that there is very strong intermittency, like up to 200 here as time. So you can see strong intermittency. Now, when I turn on alpha, alpha 10 to the minus six, you can see that the intermittency is suppressed. It reaches up to 120. If I take it even larger, 10 to the minus six, you get maybe less than 100, like around 75 in comparison to the before was 200. So it suppresses intermittency through the regularization. And this is means that, yes, you are feeding energy to the small scales, but you don't give them enough energy or momentum to, to peak or to, to explode uh, in, in, in erratic fashion as you want. Now, the question is, what happens as alpha goes to zero? Do statistical properties of the Navier-Stokes viscoelastic, the Navier-Stokes void converge to the Navier-Stokes? So uh, uh, I will, uh, because I don't have uh, much time, I would like, I have maybe another two minutes, so I would like to get into that. So the question, what happens as alpha goes to zero? Do the invariant measures, which is statistical solutions, we call them, of the Navier-Stokes void converge as alpha goes to zero to an associate invariant measures or statistical solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation? And the answer is the following. So for finite, uh, uh, for finite uh, uh, dynamical system, which is given like du, dt, I put here in u that to make them, they depend on some parameter like the viscosity. So an invariant measure 
is a probability measure that obeys the following equation. I'm talking about invariant measure, which is statistically stationary. Namely, for some class of test functions, when I take the gradient with respect to the vector v, notice that the dynamics is an Rn. So the solution of the ODE is u. And therefore, u is vector in Rn. Now I look for integration over all Rn, but with respect to the measure d mu, and v is the variable, and fv. So this is the Liouville equation corresponding to the system. So mu is called to be a statistically stationary solution for this deterministic statistically stationary if satisfies this equation for uh, for any test function, and then one can specify what kind of test functions one would like to have. One can extend that in the context of Navier-Stokes. So one can talk about stationary statistical solutions of Navier-Stokes, which are Borel probability measures, mu nu on the space HL2, in which the mean rate of dissipation of energy of mu with respect to mu is finite. Okay, I do integration over the whole space, but mu means that has to be somehow supported. Cannot be like that might have uh, it should be basically supported such that this mean rate of dissipation energy is finite. It should satisfy the Liouville equation. That's why it is a stationary statistical solution. So this is coming from the Navier-Stokes equations with respect to some test functions in T. And also you would like it to satisfy what's so-called the energy inequality to keep in mind the Larry Hope kind of like inequality. This is the solutions or what called statistical statistical solution a la Foyage for the Navier-Stokes equation. Now, what happens uh, 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 for, for, uh, for uh, the, this case? What do you mean by average? For example, usually empirically, they do kind of average over realization. And this is like, in some sense, ensemble average. But often people like to take time averages. So if you take a particular solution, okay, u of t, and take the time average, over interval zero capital T and take the limit as T goes to infinity. Usually we don't expect this limit to exist. However, one can extend the notion of limit by a theorem, which is the Han Banach theorem and look into this capital L, capital I, capital M limit, which is a generalization of the limit functional. And hence by krilov bogolyubov procedure, one can show that this functional can rep be represented by research representation theorem by a func by a measure, and hence this is will be, in some sense, a, a measure associated with the time average as people would like to, to, to take. Okay, there are many measures that one can take depending on which kind of like extension you want for this length. But this is how it's done for the Navier-Stokes equation, and now because I would like to look for the zero viscosity or a zero, zero elasticity limit, I need to talk about some kind of like a more, a stronger notion of what I call statistically stationary solution for the three navier stokes equation. I want the rate of dissipation of the palenstropy, not only the, not only the, 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 uh, the dissipation, but the palenstropy, namely the Laplacian of U to be with respect to the measure has to be finite. Is supposed to satisfy the Liouville equation for another kind of test function. And then I want it also to satisfy the energy inequality. So this is uh, my definition of strong stationary solutions. It is involving this extra condition, namely that it dissipates or supported where the, the Laplacian is finite. Now, this is the class of test functions without really getting into the details. And now here is Ethereum with Ramos which says the following, that given a sequence of invariant measures of the 3D Navier-Stokes equation, oh, sorry, of Navier-Stokes void equation, then mu alpha, as alpha goes to infinity, there exists a subsequence, which is converging to a measure mu, and mu will be a strong solution of the Navier-Stokes uh, equation. And uh, this is, in some sense, tells you that indeed, the Navier-Stokes void is regularizing the Navier-Stokes, but statistically, if you have sequence of if you have a, a, a sequence of measures, there's subsequence converging to statistical station solution. Now, which one of these subsequences converge to a limit, which is the right limit 
uh, namely physical limit. Are there unique uh, invariant measures for the Navier-Stokes? They are not unique. The one we observe in nature, the physical one, which one is that? And I think people who work uh, in, in, in probability, they are more trying to address this issue by adding some noise and see if one can see it as a limit of as noise goes to zero, et cetera. I think I, 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 I will stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Idris. Um, there's actually already a lively discussion in the chat. We have a few minutes, uh, maybe five or so for questions. So um, would anybody in the, like maybe uh, Mahendra Verma? Uh, I think oh, you had some comments. Yeah, so it's a, just a brief remark and uh, I would like comment from Professor Titi, which is very nice talk. Thanks a lot, very clear. Uh, so, uh, so the bump we showed uh, for the uh, for the energy spectrum with alpha positive, in fact, it keeps increasing when you increase alpha. That is possibly related to the bottling effect, which I think Georgie also points out. It has been work done before, so I didn't know that. But bottling is like a suppression of energy and uh, in the energy flux, and that leads to bump. It's like a, I said the river meeting the ocean. That is what I was trying to come uh, try to connect to. So uh, maybe you could comment on that. It could be related, but as I said, it's just what it does because the, there's a new energy. Okay. Uh, the gradient cannot be becoming too large. That's all. Because yes. alpha gradient is bounded. Okay. Alpha, and therefore the gradient cannot be too large and therefore it inhibits uh, the cascade of energy. Yes. Okay. That's at least my interpretation. Okay. So if, if I can make a comment. Yes, please go ahead. So, thanks Idris. So what I, I mentioned in the chat is that uh, some years ago with Marc Grasset, we studied the, exactly this problem. So the visit case, okay, in 3D oil and void simulations. And what we observed is what Mahendra in, indeed said that is um, partial thermalization. Okay, you start from large scale. And as energy has traveled to go farther, the scale related to alpha, so one over alpha squared, it's the energy cannot follow very efficiently. And you observe a bottleneck, okay? And it can be very steep, so k squared. And uh, so this is so the image you must have is to have a Kolmogorov followed by a k squared and then followed by exponential decay, okay? And the last bump, what you eventually see that the system needs to thermalize to rear all the modes. But this last one go to infinity with a very, very um, small power law. Okay. So the, with, just a comment, we did that with uh, Euler 3D, so big DNS, and we pushed a bit kind of the resolution with uh, Eddie QNM and uh, Elite model that we tailor a bit to, to mimic this. And the fact was strong, we, we didn't, we, we started also taking a higher power of the Laplacian on the left-hand side. So we took Laplacian power two and three, I remember, if you remember well. And this effect was uh, enhanced quite a lot. So just, just a comment. So it's, I think it's very close to your, your certain shell models. In fact, the, the, the flat spectrum is the thermalization spectrum for the shell model. Yeah, but this yeah. is a thermalization that's independent of the cutoff of the simulation. That is it's nice. So it's followed by exponential decay. Well, thank you. Um, were there other questions? Um, I actually had a, a question for Id, uh, Idris. Um, uh, what, how, how would you compare the NSV model with Lance Alpha? I mean, so what are the relative merits of them? I know you've done work on both. They both regularize uh, okay. Navier Stokes. Yes, uh, the, the difference is the following that uh, in the, uh, this model, uh, the Navier-Stokes Navier alpha, alpha, it is, uh, no, there is some echo, somebody is like echoing, I cannot, okay. Uh, the the Navier-Stokes the, the, the Navier alpha uh, is, uh, the nonlinearity is worse than the, this particular model. So this particular model is u dot nabla u, while in the Navier-Stokes alpha model, it is u dot nabla u minus alpha square Laplacian u. So it is worse. 
And that's why without viscosity in the invisit case, still we don't know how to show global existence of say strong solutions for the invisit alpha model or the Euler alpha model, etc. But here we can do that, okay? So they are completely different from this point of view as far as the analysis is concerned. And uh, 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 we did some numerics and some of this uh, energy spectrum analysis that I mentioned, we have done it also for those models in which we also see two regimes like uh, K to the minus uh, two thirds and then sharper and then the dissipation with viscosity. But what this model is showing this kind of like flat, this pump is in some sense, it is slowing the dissipation of energy, which is, uh, as I said, I would like to understand it. We gave this kind of like, uh, 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 let's say physical arguments based on time scales of why we see what we see, but uh, one needs in some sense more rigorous uh, approach for that. And I don't know how to do it yet. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have to go over to, to cloud now. Uh, so thank you very much Idris for your talk. You're welcome, thank you.